we left off is with the dispute between the pessimist and the optimist. The optimist holding that these things, that determinism and responsibility are reconcilable, and the ter determinist saying, no, they're not. So we want to speak on behalf of the optimist, that even if determinism should turn out to be true, then we can still make sense of our ideas of responsibility right, and of obligation. By the way, just a quick note here and a quick sidebar. Um, Strawson isn't saying that determinism is true, right? He's making it a conditional, right? He's saying if it should turn out to be true. So he's not committing himself to the truthity or the falsity of determinism. Truthity, that's not a word. The truthhood, the, the truth, truth, it's just the word truth, isn't it? There you go. Um, the truth or the falsity of determinism. Um, but he's saying, but he wants to say that no matter how that debate turns out, we can still make sense of the idea of responsibility. So, how does he get here? Well, he, so, uh, so you get an insight if you have to have your text with you. On page 151 and 152, he has, um, he has, he has sort of two sentences that really indicate what he's getting at here. On page 151, towards the bottom, under, you know, about halfway through where section three starts, he writes, um, I want to speak, at least to first, of something else, of the non-detached attitudes and reactions of people directly involved in transactions with each other, of the attitudes and reactions of offended parties and beneficiaries, of such things as gratitude, resentment, forgiveness, love, and hurt feelings. So in thinking about praise and blame and responsibility, what he wants to do is he wants to focus on those cases where it's really hard to detach the agents involved, or you know, the people involved, from the attitudes formed, right? So he wants to consider something like gratitude, or as the name of the essay indicates, resentment. And so if you flip to the next page, the third sentence on page 152, he writes, the central commonplace that I want to insist on is the very great importance that we attach to the attitudes and intentions towards us of other human beings, and the great extent to which our personal feelings and reactions depend upon or involve our beliefs about these attitudes and intentions. So, the central idea for Strasser, right, the in a sense, the central metaphysical idea, the central claim about human nature that he's most interested in, is that um, we attach a lot of importance to others' attitudes and intentions. Not just a little bit of importance, right? I mean, so much importance that we structure our lives around these things. I mean, think about what we do to impress other people, right? Think about the things that we do and the things that we say so that other people will like us or not like us, or avoid people not liking us. You know what I mean, friends. I mean, the fact is, is that we care a whole lot about what other people think about us. I mean, and you might say that, you know, you're a free spirit, and, you know, you just could care less, but, in fact, that, you know, either you're a sociopath or you're a liar, right? Because the fact is, is that we care deeply what other people think about us, right? When you submit a paper to me, you care what I think about this product of your work, right? When we talk with our friends, with our parents, with our neighbors, with our significant others, we care about what these people think about us. And that's just a fact of experience. I mean, this is something we know. I mean, this isn't like hidden from us, right? This isn't something we had to discover through really difficult scientific investigation. This is as obvious as the nose on our, noses on our faces. Right? So we care deeply what other people think about us, right, and how other people treat us. If you do something to me accidentally, I'm likely to let it go. If you do something to me intentionally, I'm likely not to let it go. Furthermore, we are nested in huge, huge webs of social relationships. And so, for example, we stand in relationship to one another, right? I am the guy teaching this. You are the student taking this class. But even then, Right? This isn't like a typical teacher-student relationship. 
right? I mean, I never get to actually interact with you in person, right, unless we happen to run into each other on campus, right? You know, we don't get to sit down and talk in my office if you're having a problem with a particular philosophical idea. In fact, this is very unlike the traditional, you know, my, when I typically teach a class, when, which there's a lot of back and forth, right? Here, I'm giving you lots of information via these videos, these little clips, um, and you ask me a few questions over email or through the discussion boards, right? So this is just one relationship among many that we have. I mean, think about your parents, your significant others, your really close friends, your kind of close friends, your okay friends, right, people that you might talk to at a party but not outside that party, your coworkers that you kind of get along with, your coworkers that you don't really get along with, your neighbors, uh, you know, people you meet while walking down the street. I mean, all of these are social relationships that we have, and all of them are different, right? Things you might say to your parents aren't going to be things that you say to your boss right, or to your friend, or things you might say to a significant other, you're not going to say to your, uh, you know, to your friend, well, well, you might say them to your friends, uh, you, you know, certainly wouldn't say them to your boss or to your, to, to your teachers. So, in addition to having this multitude of relationships, we attach different levels of importance to what different people think about different things. So, for example, um, you know, I care deeply what some of my colleagues think about my own teaching and research. Um, I don't care too much about what the, what the checkout clerk at the uh, liquor store thinks about my teaching and my research. I mean, sure, like I want it to be relevant for that person. Um, but, you know, my career doesn't hinge on what the person at the checkout counter thinks. So, not only are we engaged in all these relationships, but our investment in what other people think about certain things is going to change from one relationship to another. Now, despite this huge, sort of, this, this sort of unwieldy uh, group of relationships and attitudes and thoughts and feelings, it seems like we can provide some order. So the first thing to know is that what we're interested in are what, are what Strawson calls reactive attitudes. So these are attitudes or beliefs, opinions, ideas, uh, judgments, assessments that we, re that we adopt in reaction to something a person says or does. So we're interested in reactive attitudes, right? Ways we respond to others ways others respond to us. Now, there is one pervasive feature of our social lives, um, aside from our reactive attitudes. So, again, if you happen to have your text with you, if you take a look at, uh, on page, if you take a look at page 153, he says, uh, you know, uh, the penultimate final paragraph of section 3, um, he says that in general, we demand some degree of goodwill or regard on the part of those who stand in these relationships to us, through the forms, uh, though the forms we require, re we require it to take vary widely in different connections. The range and intensity of our reactive attitudes towards goodwill, its absence or its opposite, vary no less widely. So, we demand that others treat us well, right, or give us some respect, right? So, you know, when you submit a paper to me, for example, you expect that I'm going to read this paper, right? That I'm going to, well, that I'm going to read it and not just assign it a grade based on whatever I'm feeling at the moment. So, that is to say that when I do that, I am showing goodwill towards you. I'm giving your work some regard. Or that when people say things, right, when we say things to others, we expect, what other pe we expect that other people take the things that we say seriously, right, that they don't put us, like, in a little box, or they just don't, like, pat us on the head and send us on our way, right, that we are treated, well, I mean, as not exactly equals, but on par socially, right, that we are people who deserve and expected to be listened to. 
So he wants to focus. So Strawson wants to focus on a few ca on a few cases of reactive attitudes, right? On a few instances of it. Um, the one he wants to focus on is resentment. So we might begin by asking ourselves, what is it that when we adopt an attitude of resentment or when, uh, towards another, or when another adopts an attitude of resentment towards us? Well, clearly sometimes it's warranted, right? Sometimes a person will do something and resentment is the right attitude to adopt, right? I ought to resent them for doing that. So if a friend, uh, so if somebody who claims to have been my friend, um, you know, steals money from me or makes off with my significant other or steals some of my ideas, then I'm going to resent that person, right? And that seems like the right attitude to take. But there are cases in which the adoption of the attitude of resentment can be mitigated. So, for example, imagine, uh, imagine that uh, I have a good friend of mine um, who, uh, who, turns, who, who publishes a paper on something that I've been working on for a long time. Well, I might be resentful of this person, right? Um, and I might email him or her to say, hey, look, I think that you stole my idea, right? And this person I emailed my friend might say, well, no, 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 right? Like, I didn't steal your ideas. Um, I was thinking about it, you know, I was thinking about it here. Here's some drafts of stuff I've been working on. Um, you know, here are all the times I sent it off to another journal and it got rejected. So in other words, my friend might offer me evidence for withholding the attitude of resentment, right? So it seems like this happens uh, with lots of attitudes that we adopt, right? That we might adopt an attitude, but then we sort of pull back on it a little bit because of mitigating circumstances. Now, in the first case, when we adopt an attitude and it's fully merited, right? So when I resent somebody and they deserve it, right? Or when I forgive somebody, and they deserve it, right? Or when I express gratitude towards somebody, and they deserve it. Then those are what Strawson called the participant reactive attitudes, right? So again, those are participant reactive attitudes. So these are reactive attitudes we have towards others as part of participating in an interpersonal relationship, right? And so these are attitudes that we have towards others in virtue of what we understand them to be doing. So those are participant reactive attitudes. So, you know, so if you tell me off and I don't deserve it, I'm going to get mad, right? Or if you steal from me, I'm going to get mad. Let's do not mad one, right? Or if you compliment me on my haircut, then I'm going to be appreciative and grateful, right? These are, you know, so these are, um, so, so these are the participant reactive attitudes. The other class of case turns out to be a bit more complex, right? Well, participant reactive attitudes, they're complicated too, but we're ignoring their complexity for right now, right? Their, their complexity doesn't interest us too much, right? The complexity of the other case uh, interests us. So the other case is what are, are what are called objective reactive attitudes. Again, those are objective reactive attitudes. Right, so these are cases in which we suspend our feelings, right? Suspend our ordinary judgments. Now, um, sometimes we suspend these feelings because um, because the agent didn't know or didn't realize what they were doing. You know, so for example, um, let's suppose uh, let's suppose that I'm sitting on the ground, right? I've got my arms leaning behind me. And you step on um, you step on my fingers, right? I'm going to get mad because you stepped on my fingers and it hurts, right? But um, you didn't know or you didn't realize that you were stepping on my fingers. So in this case, I hold you responsible for stepping on for I hold you responsible for the action of stepping on my fingers. But you didn't know you were hurting me in walking, right? In stepping on my fingers, well, because you didn't realize you were stepping on my fingers, right? For all you knew, you were just walking. And so I hold you responsible for the stepping action, but I don't hold you responsible for the injury done, right? Because you weren't aware that you were injuring me in performing the stepping action. Right? So that's one time when we suspend our feelings. Other times when we suspend our feelings, it's when uh, it's because we view the individual involved 
differently, right? So in the first case, I don't view you differently, right? Rather, what I do is I sort of neglect the injury done by you, right? In the second case, we view the agent differently, the individual differently. So, how might this come about? Well, sometimes we have bad days, right? Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we get a root canal, and so we get pissy with people, right? Or some days, we just have really crappy days, and, and so we're a bit short with people. So in these cases, you know, we, we just aren't ourselves. And in fact, we talk about it like that, right? We say that the person isn't being him or herself. So in this case, ordinarily, we see you as a full agent, the object of participant reactive attitudes, but in this instance, I adopt an objective attitude, right? I suspend my typical judgments, right, because you're having a bad day. So that's one case. The other case is when we suspend our responses, when we suspend our attitudes, our typical attitudes, all the time, right? So when might we do this? Well, consider somebody with dementia, right? So somebody with dementia um, isn't fully aware of what he or she is doing all the time. And so we suspend our typical response to their behavior precisely because they have dementia, right? So let's suppose that something great big and important happens to me, right? And um, and I tell my, you know, I tell my parents about it. Suppose my parents have dementia. Well, when I call them the next time to talk some more about this great, big, exciting thing that's happening to me, and if they don't remember, well, I mean, I might get upset, but I would likely also think to myself, well, they have dementia, right? They're not all there. They're not going to remember all of the things that I tell them that happen. And so... While, my, while ordinarily I might get upset, in this case, getting upset would be out of place because the people towards whom I'm adopting the attitude are, well, they're not like ordinary social moral agents, right? They're abnormal in a sense. So the way that Strawson talks about this, this final case that we just mentioned where all, where all the time the individual um, is exempt from the typical participant reactive attitudes. Um, he says that we're seeing the recipients of these attitudes in a cool, objective way. In fact, again, in your text on page 156, um, he says that, uh, he says, uh, it's about halfway down the page, he says, that we look, we look with an objective eye on the compulsive behavior of the neurotic or the tiresome behavior of a very young child, thinking in terms of treatment or training. But we can sometimes look with something like the same eye on the behavior of the normal and the mature. We have this resource, and we could sometimes use it as a refuge, say, from the strains of involvement, or as an aid to policy, or simply out of intellectual curiosity. Being human, we cannot, in the normal case, do this for long or altogether. If the strains of involvement, say, continue to be too great, then we have to do something else, like severing a relationship. But what is above all interesting is the tension here, is the tension there is in us between the participant attitude and the objective attitude. One is tempted to say between our humanity and our intelligence, but to say this would be to distort, distort both notions. So what is the what is the point of all this? What is the import of all of this? Well, we have, broadly speaking, two kinds of reactive attitudes. We have participant reactive attitudes, and we have objective reactive attitudes. And with the participant reactive attitudes, we treat the object of the attitude, the recipient of the attitude, as an ordinary, fully capable, and with it, social agent. We can put this succinctly by saying that we regard them interpersonally. Right? We think of them as people with whom we are friends or could be friends or we have general and robust social relationships. Again, 
you know, just think of standard examples like our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, you know, people we ride the bus with, stuff like that. On the other hand, we have objective reactive attitudes. And in this case, we're seeing the recipient of these attitudes in a cool and objective way, right, as the object of social policy. So again, we have these, again, these two sets of attitudes are very important to keep distinct, right? It's crucial for Strawson that we keep these things distinct. Because he then asks us, suppose we accept, for the sake of the you know, for the sake of the argument, let's say that determinism is true. Well, what does that mean for our objective reactive attitudes that we adopt all the time? And for our participant reactive attitudes. Well, Strawson argues that if we accept that determinism is true, then we are committing ourselves to seeing everybody in terms of the objective reactive attitudes. Why is that? Well, because we're severing our interpersonal relationships with these people. Because everybody's behavior is determined. And so we wouldn't see behaviors in terms of adult human relationships. Right? We'd, all, we'd see and understand behaviors in terms of deterministic causes. So, in other words, we have to excuse everybody's behavior. We have to think of everybody's behavior as being like that of somebody with dementia or somebody with schizophrenia. Right? Their behaviors are the product of deterministic causes. So we would see everybody uh, in terms of the objective reactive attitudes. Right? We have to distance ourselves from everybody. Right? We can imagine how this might turn out. So suppose that you insult me one day. Right? Um, in, you know, you say something like, hey, nice haircut, Lassiter. Right? So, my initial impulse is to get mad, be like, well, screw you, buddy. Right? But if determinism is right, I'd have to think to myself, or I would think to myself, well, they did that because, you know, maybe they had a bad day, right, if we're going to be sort of humans about it, right, endorse psychological determinism. Or if I'm going to be a spinazist about it, I might say, well, they couldn't have failed to say that. They really had no choice in saying it. So, you know what, I'm just going to let it go. So, if determinism is true, right, if we accept, or more precisely, if we accept the truth of determinism, then we are committing ourselves to seeing all behavior in light of objective, reactive attitudes that we adopt with people who merit them all the time. Right? Now, could we do this in principle? Yeah, right? So, Strawson says, it's conceivable that we could do this all the time. But it's practically inconceivable. Right? He says that um, you know, he says that you know, even though we could imagine a world like this, we can't imagine our world like this. It's just not part of our everyday lives. Right? We just I mean, we can't do it. Right? Go back to that initial mundane, commonplace fact that he started with. We care so much about what other people think of us. And we care so much about the intentions and the attitudes of other people. Right? That's a basic fact for us. That's not something we're going to give up. But if we accept the truth of determinism, then, well, it seems like, in a way, we'd have to give it up. right? If we thought of determinism as irreconcilable with, you know, holding people responsible. So, we simply can't adopt objective reactive attitudes all the time, right? It's just, it's, it's simply not possible, right? It's not possible for the ways, for the lives that we live, right? For the attitudes that we actually have. And in fact, um, again, if you happen to have your text, um, on page one, uh, on page one fifty nine, towards the bottom, he says that our right towards the bottom. He says 
this commitment, so our commitment to ordinary interpersonal attitudes that we adopt and that get uh, sort of, you know that are, get thrown back towards us, this commitment is part of the general framework of human life, not something that can come up for, for review as particular cases can come up for review within this general framework. So the idea is that we simply we can't give this up, right? This is part and parcel of what it is to be human. To give this up would to be would to fail to be human. Right? We can't give up these interpersonal attitudes. So, if we accept that determinism is true, then it seems like we have to adopt these. Uh, we have to adopt these attitudes, right? If we believed that determinism is true, then we'd have to adopt these attitudes, the objective reactive attitudes, all the time. So. What does this bear on whether or not determinism is actually true? Well, in a sense, what this does, right, to go, what this does is it gives Strawson the space to say, is determinism true or false? Frankly, for us, it just doesn't matter. What's important for us is whether we believe determinism to be true or false, right? Because believing determinism to be true has a bearing on our uh, on the reactive attitudes we should or shouldn't adopt. So, what's important for Strawson is that the question of the truth or the falsity of determinism simply has no bearing on how we hold others responsible. Right? We hold others responsible and we adopt reactive attitudes independently of the truth or falsity of determinism. And we bring this out by saying that if determinism turned out to be true, then we'd adopt the objective reactive attitudes towards everybody. But we can't do this. We practically can't do this. And so we just, frankly, shouldn't be terribly concerned with whether or not determinism turns out to be true because it has no bearing on our assessments of responsibility. So then the question becomes, what does have a bearing on our assessments of responsibilities? Well, in a way, it's a matter of how we think about responsibility and our ordinary social patterns of holding people responsible. So, to put it kind of less cryptically and haltingly, what matters for us is how socially others get held responsible. So it's not that responsibility is important because it's socially efficacious, right? It's socially efficacious because it's, because it's important for us. And it's important because it's part of our network of social practices, right? Holding people responsible is just something we do. And in some cases, it's very clear, right? That's when we adopt the participant reactive attitudes some cases it's not clear, and that's when we have to adopt the objective reactive attitudes. But in either case, we can't let go of the reactive attitudes. Right? We can't let go of the fact that we care too much about others' intentions, about others' attitudes, and how we are caught up in the lives of others, and how others are caught up in our lives. So rather than fixating on the question of, are we free or are we determined, Strawson, as I read him, says, that doesn't matter. What matters is how we respond to others, right? whether or not we hold agents responsible for the things that we do. Right? That comes first and foremost. So it's responsibility before determinism, responsibility before free